We're back looking at the epistle of Paul the Apostle to Timothy. Timothy is a pastoral epistle, so it's got all kinds of great instruction for a pastor. It's got uh, it's like the manual for a local church. What you should you look for in a local church? How should the local church operate? And this is where you go to learn all that stuff. This is the manual for it. So, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Paul this is Paul talking to Timothy here. And he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So he said in verse 1, I exhort, therefore. Okay, what does he mean by that? I exhort. Well, when you exhort... Paul is ex exhorting him. He's encouraging by words. That's what that means. He's just encouraging him to do something. I exhort, therefore. He says, therefore. For Therefore basically just means for this reason. I exhort, therefore. For what reason? Well, in the previous chapter, he got into talking about how these guys, Hymenaeus and Alexander, were holding the faith not in a good conscience, and concerning faith, they made a mess of things. Concerning faith, they had made shipwreck. And they ended up getting delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So, he tells Timothy, I exhort therefore, for that reason, you know, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We don't want men ending up like Hymenaeus and Alexander. And getting delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for all men. Everybody. First of all. I exhort therefore that first of all. So prayer is at the top of the list. If that's if Paul says first of all concerning prayer. It must be very important. That's at the top of the list. First of all. I exhort therefore that first of all. Supplications. Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Notice these different types of prayers. So supplications, what's that? Supplications is like a just a you praying, and it's like a request for supplies. And let's look at Philippians four nineteen. Like I said, I'm gonna go kind of slower, and give you a chance to turn to these verses. Philippians four nineteen. It says in Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So God can supply all your need. You just got to ask him. Tell him what you need. And most times he's supplying my need even when I don't ask him. Well, you know, what did James say? You have not because you ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. You know, you you need something, pray for it. He'll supply all your need. Supplications. That's God. God's going to supply my need. Supplications is request for supplies. So it says supplications, prayers. Well, what's prayers? Well, you know, just talking to God and asking for things in general. Just simply talking to God. And you already know the famous verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, what does Paul say? Pray without ceasing. Now, obviously, you can't pray, pray every second of every day. That just simply means, you know, throughout the day, you're, there's a, it's a consistent prayer life. You know, you pray when you get up, consistently praying at times throughout the day, praying at night, and you did, you, you prayed without ceasing. You did it all day long. I mean, there was times when you wasn't praying, but consistently throughout the day you prayed. So, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, 
What's well, intercessions? Intercessions, that's praying on the behalf of somebody else. You know, that you got Christian brothers and sisters, friends, maybe you know them at work, at church. You're praying for them. You're praying for men that aren't saved, that can't pray for themselves. You're praying for them too. That's intercessions. Praying on the behalf of somebody else. And Paul's always talking about how he ceases not to pray for somebody. We shouldn't just spend all our time praying for ourselves. We should be praying for other people too. So it says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Giving of thanks. That's just simply thanking God for things. Things that you have. All those spiritual blessings that you have that he's given you. These spiritual blessings you have because of his grace. Things that he's gave you because you don't deserve. Things are things that he's given you that you don't deserve. And then thanking him for things that you don't have. Troubles that you don't have. You can thank God for things that hasn't come your way. And like when I see something bad happen, I thank God that that hadn't happened to me. And that's God's mercy. God keeping you from something that you do deserve. So you can thank God for his grace, the things that God's given you that you don't deserve. You can thank God for his mercy, the things that he's kept you from that you do deserve. And I deserve hell on earth coming right towards me like a freight train hitting me in the face. That's what I deserve. And I don't know how I got it going so good. I should be laid on the side of the road, smashed in a bunch of pieces. But God's mercy uh, kept me from that. So giving of thanks, just thanking God for things. Thanking God for other people in your life. The good and the bad. You know, I thank God for the good people in my life that's helping me. I thank God for my family. But you can also thank God for your enemies and the people that are a thorn in your flesh because the thorns in your flesh is what's keeping you humble. They're many times what's keeping you right with God. And no matter how you look at it, whatever God's put in your life, you can thank God for it because it's helping you no matter what it is. If they're good, they're helping you. If they're bad, they're helping you. Now, it's it's like a paradox. You got somebody bad in your life. You can thank God that it's helping you be become a better person. But at the same time, you can be praying to get rid of them too. So you see, there's, a, every, there's so much stuff to pray about. You, you couldn't write it all down. You couldn't run out of stuff to pray about. Because it's just endless. You can start at the beginning of your day and go all the way to the end of your day. Every little thing that happens, you could be praying about it. So I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, praying for things you need, prayers, just, you know, talking to God in general, asking for things in general, intercessions, that's you praying on the behalf of somebody else, and giving of thanks, thanking God for things, be made for all men, all men. So we need to pray for saved men, and we need to pray for lost men. Treat all men good, all men. Nobody should we be treating bad. Nobody should we be, you know, mistreating, wishing bad upon. We need to treat all men good, saved or lost. Let's look at some verses that go along with this all men and how we should treat all men. It says in Romans twelve seventeen. if you want to look at Romans twelve seventeen real quick. And like I said, I'm going to give you time to turn to it if you've got your Bible with you. That's Romans 12, 17. It says in Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Romans 12, 18. 
if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Uh, Paul is big on treating all men right, no matter who they are. When I go to work, I treat everybody the same. Everybody's treated the same. You treat everybody with respect. Even if you don't agree with how they live. You know, you got sodomites you have to go work with. You treat them nice. You be nice to them. You be friendly to them. You don't have to approve their lifestyle. You don't have to act like you approve of it. But you treat them nice. And you pray for that person. You pray that they'll get saved. You pray that they'll then live right. You don't just be mean to people and stick your nose up at people. I'll go out places, maybe at a restaurant or something, and I'll see Christian people come in. And if they see like one of these, a sodomite or something, they'll just give them a mean look, stick their nose up in the air towards them. Uh, that does not help. That's not helping the Lord Jesus Christ. That's helping the devil because those people already think that you're, you're just a, hypocritical judge and when you stick your nose up in the air at people and you just think you're better than everybody else you're actually the one that's really in the wrong too and you know we're not helping nobody by being a bunch of judgmental hypocrites even though we don't approve of their lifestyle uh, lost people are going to be lost people sinners are going to be sinners when i go to work i don't expect all these sinners when I say sinners, I mean unsaved people because I'm a sinner too. But I'm, refer I'm saying sinners in terms of unsaved people. When I see all these sinners, I don't expect them to act like I act. I don't expect them to have a clean mouth. I don't expect them to live a clean lifestyle. I expect a lost person to act like a lost person. And until they get saved, they're most likely always going to act like a lost person. So... It's my responsibility to live peaceably with all men. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Pray for all men. All these prayers, supplications, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. That's how the Apostle Paul sees it. Pray for all men. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 9.22. 1 Corinthians 9.22. If you're in 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul says, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul was just trying to save people, trying to get people saved. He said, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save save some that doesn't mean that he was going around participating in their sinful lifestyle to get them saved that doesn't mean to get it you know you know to get club hoppers saved you don't go to the club and be a club hopper that's not what that means what this could mean is <clears throat> you you uh you learn about people you learn about the things that they do and then you can have a conversation with them and, you know, take this. You learn the scriptures, you learn about people, and you can apply the scriptures to their life. You know, if you're working with somebody that's like a big time fisherman or something, if you know some things about being a fisherman and you know the Bible, you can relate the Bible to his life. Things like that. And that just, this. That's just one example. This just you can go really far with this. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You take somebody's life, you figure out what they're into, you figure out what their hobbies are, what they like to do, where they're from, what their culture is, and you can take that and you can relate the Bible to that, whatever it is. And that's how you can win people. And this this involves, you know, going beyond just witnessing to random people because you're going to 
have people in your everyday life, all men in your everyday life, you're going to get to know that person. You're going to find out what they like, where they grew up, where they come from, what their culture is. You can uh, learn about that type of stuff, and you learn the Bible, and you can relate the Bible to, to their life. So Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Okay, now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2. Okay, now he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2, he says in verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For kings, pray for those in power. We got presidents here, so we would pray for them. We don't like the president. You, you most likely, if you're a born-again believer, you probably do not like the president and what he stands for. But we need to pray for him. Pray for all men. Do I think he's a saved man? No, I think he's a lost man. I don't think he's a wise man. I think if you're 70-something years old, you ought to have enough wisdom and knowledge to, to lead people. He don't have it. Now, at the same time, when it comes to Trump, he's 70-something years old. His spiritual mentor was a woman young enough to be his daughter. That's He should have been, done made, been further along at 70 years old. You see what I mean? Obviously, I like Trump better. But, you know, there, the reason he looks so good is because of who he's running against. If he wasn't running against these types of people, he's not going to look very good. He's, he's cool and he's got a likable personality. But let's just be realistic, realistic about it. The one we got, we need to pray that he gets saved and gets right with God. Because obviously he ain't the slightest bit right with God at all. And Trump, maybe he's, at, at best, he's a baby Christian. At best. Uh, he's not you shouldn't consider him your spiritual leader. You see, we need to pray for uh, the one that we got that he's going to get saved and and then get right with God. And if Trump becomes a president again, we need to pray that he grows as a Christian and lives right and gets the right morals, gets hooked up with the right types of preachers and not these TV preachers and these women preachers that don't even obey the Word of God themselves. Because that's that's not a good spiritual mentor to have. Paula White or whatever her name is, that's not a good spiritual mentor. We need to pray for these people. Pray for kings, for all that are in authority. Who's in authority in your life? Your pastor, your parents, your principal, your the police. You know, you got all these people against the police. How, how crazy are you? If you didn't have the police, you're in trouble. If I, I, I thank God for the police. I respect the police. If a policeman pulled me over and told me to get out of the car, I'm going to get out of the car. If he tells me to put my hands on the hood, I'm going to put my hands on the hood. Tell me to put my hands on my head, I'm going to put my hands on my head. If he tells me to do the hokey pokey, turn myself around, I'm going to do the hokey pokey, turn myself around. I'm going to do whatever he says. He's the police. He's in authority. Now, maybe I didn't do nothing wrong, and he'll find out I didn't do nothing wrong. But until he finds out I didn't do nothing wrong, I'm going to do what he says. The people that in authority, who's the head of the house? The man is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. If you're a wife, you need to pray for your husband. So, for what purpose do we pray for those that are in authority? What does it say? You know, we need to pray for all men, for kings, and for all 
that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. If I pray for the people that are in authority over me, my president, your parents, your principal, your policeman, if you're a wife, your husband, if you pray for them and they get right with God, then it's going to allow you to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Imagine if you are a, a woman and you your husband is lost and he don't live right. Imagine if you pray for him and he got saved. Your life is going to do a 180. You're going to be able to live and lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It's going to be so much easier to live for God in all godliness and honesty with a saved husband who lives right than it is with an unsaved husband husband who don't live right. Imagine if you're in a country with a wicked atheist king or president and he got saved and imagine what it would be like and how easier it would be to live a, go a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So that's why we pray for him. And I'm going to uh, have you turn us a, a couple verses. Look at Second Chronicles Chapter 14 and verse 1. Second Chronicles 14 in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 14 and verse 1. And this is one of the best kings here. It's a king named Asa. He wasn't a perfect king. He wasn't as good as David. But he's up there. Pretty high. Second Chronicles 14. So we pray for kings and for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And I want to show you this Old Testament example of what it's like when you have a king in authority that is a godly king. Second Chronicles 14.1 It says, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. Now look at this. In his days, the land was quiet ten years. I wonder why. Look at the next verse. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and break down the images, and cut down the groves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. Also he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. You see that? He came in there. He did right in the sight of the Lord. He got rid of all that junk, the altars of the strange gods, the high places. He broke down the images. He cut down the groves. And he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. And he, he took away the high places, the images. The kingdom was quiet before him. You got a king like that. You got a president like that. It's going to be quiet. Imagine you got a godly neighborhood. You're going to hear sirens and people screaming, people shooting. You're hearing gunshots. Are you worried about drive-bys in a godly neighborhood? If you got a godly neighborhood, it's quiet. You don't hear loud music. You don't hear music so loud that it's jarring your tin roof. It's quiet. You live in a quiet and peaceable life. You go to a bad neighborhood, what do you hear? You hear people screaming. You hear gunshots. You hear music so loud that it's waking you up. You hear people partying all night that's waking you up. There's no rest in it. And it's not quiet. But you pray for the people that's in authority. And you can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And if you have less resistance from authority, you can preach Jesus Christ without them locking you up, without them taking your rights, without them persecuting you. Now, if you get persecuted, count it joy to suffer shame for his name. But at the same time, we should be wanting to be able to go out and give the gospel out without any resistance, without any persecution. You see? You know, you... However you got it, you just be content with it. If you're getting persecuted, be content with it. If you're not being persecuted, be content with it. 
<clears throat> so that's why we pray for the people in authority. And if you got somebody in authority that's godly, it's going to be quiet. And you know, like in 2 Kings 11.20, they had Athaliah for a time, the Queen Athaliah, she was in authority. It wasn't quiet. They got rid of her. They got rid of her. You know what? It was quiet in the land. When they got rid of her, it was quiet in the land. It says, And all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet. And they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. They got she once she got out, it was quiet. You get somebody that's godly in there, you're gonna have it's gonna be quiet. But you know, you whoever's in authority in your life, you don't mistreat them, you don't boot, do bad to them. You, you pray for them, pray for their, all that are in authority. Pray that they'll get saved. Pray that they'll get right with God. So, I exhort therefore. That first of all, supplications, prayers, and accessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For all men. For kings. And for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So it says it's good and acceptable in the sight of of God our Savior. That's an amazing thing. That shows that there are things that we can do, us sinful humans can do, that pleases God. That's an amazing thing because most mortal man can't be pleased. You know, you got verses like Proverbs 27, 20. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. Man can't be pleased. But you can please God just by doing what he says. And he'll honestly be pleased by it. You pray for, you do all this praying, praying for all men. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That's an amazing thing that you can please God. It says in 1 John 3, 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When God looks at you and your life from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, are you doing anything that would be pleasing to God in His sight? There are things we can do that pleases God. So this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Notice that, God our Savior. I believe that is a, a verse that proves the deity of Christ. A verse that proves... That Jesus Christ is God Almighty. That Jesus Christ is God in, this, God in the flesh because He is our Savior. Let's look at some verses for that. God our Savior. Jesus Christ is God and He is our Savior. And if you look at Isaiah 43, 11. I'm going to have you turn to Isaiah 43, 11. Let's look at this verse real quick. This is the Lord God Almighty talking. In Isaiah 43, 11, he says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. That's God talking about himself. He said, beside me there is no Savior. Is there more than one Savior? No, there's one Savior. But who's your Savior? There's no, there's no other name under heaven given among men where Bible we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He's God in the flesh. And the things that we, when we pray for others, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who's our Savior? The Lord Jesus Christ. God, there's one God. There's not three gods. There's not a whole bunch of gods. There's one God. And First John, look at 1 John 5 and verse 7. 1 John 5, 7. This is what people refer to as the Trinity. Now, obviously, the Trinity is not a Bible word. I like to call it the Godhead. But I don't see anything wrong with saying Trinity. When somebody says it, you know, some people just get full of just indignation and go off on somebody that says Trinity. I know what they're talking about when they say Trinity. They're talking about the Godhead. They're talking about 1 John 5, 7. 
where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. When somebody says, well, explain the Godhead, I just say 1 John 5, 7, For there are three, these three are one. Not three gods, it's one God. But as far as I can explain it is this verse. I can't explain it. I can't wrap my head around God. You know, his ways are past finding out. You know, he's, a, he's way above me. But I can tell you this because the Bible says that there are three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. You want me to explain the Godhead? That's as far as I can explain it. And Jesus Christ is God. And he's my Savior. For the, so back in 1 Timothy chapter 2. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So he is our Savior. And it says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now look at 1 Timothy 4.10. I'm going to show you some stuff against Calvinism. The false teaching that God save, chooses who's, who he's going to save. And chooses who he's not going to save. In the sense that you don't have a choice in the matter. You know, there's people that go around they, that are called Calvinists. They believe that God chooses for you whether you're going to be saved or not. And I'm going to show you that that's not true. It says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Back in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy 4.10. It says, who will have all men to be saved? And to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, he this this means that it's God's will that all men be saved. Not that he's going to have all men be saved, but it's his will that all men be saved. And all men means all men, not just all of the elect, you see. In 1 Timothy 4.10, it says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we have trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now, we're back to this all men thing again. Now, all men before, it meant all men, as in all men, saved and lost. So, First Timothy 4.10 says he's the Savior of all men, all men saved and lost. But look at the next phrase, especially of those that believe. He's the Savior of all men, even the ones that don't accept him. They're going to hell because they don't accept him, but he's still their savior. They just rejected their savior. You see, Jesus is your savior, and he died for you, but you've got to accept the payment. If you don't believe on Jesus Christ, you reject the payment, and you go to hell. But he's still your savior. He still bought you, but you rejected the payment. You see, he wants all men to be saved, but you've got to accept him. You gotta accept the salvation, or you're not saved. But First Timothy chapter two and verse four says, Who will have all men to be saved? And they come into the knowledge of the truth. If you're not saved, he wants you to be saved. Because he's the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. You gotta believe. You gotta believe on Jesus Christ. Let me show you another good verse to go along with this. Second Peter three and verse nine. I give you a chance to turn to this very important verse, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. So all men in the context is all men without exception. It's not just some people who he chose to be saved. It's God's will for everyone to be saved, but they got to accept the payment. And this first 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. No matter who you are, he wants you to be saved. There's nobody on this planet that God doesn't want to be saved. He wants all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. 
You know, plain verses, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, anybody, you call upon the name of the Lord that it says, uh, of a sincere heart, you got it. You're saved. Because he wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. He wants you to be saved more than the best soul winner in the world wants you to be saved. The Apostle Paul, he said, I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, that they might be saved. Paul would have went to hell for the, his kinsmen, the Jews, if they would accept the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how much he wanted to be saved. God wanted you to be saved more than that. Because you know what? God did go to hell for you. God died on the cross for you. He took your hell on the cross. When he was on the cross, all the sin of the world, and he, every sinner's eternity in hell, he suffered that on the cross all at once. All in that time on the cross. Only God could do that. He took your hell. He went to hell for you. He, Paul w could wish himself a curse from Christ. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he did do that. He was separated from the Father when he was on the cross. He became sin for you that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God would rather die than to see you go to hell. God would rather go to hell than to see you go to hell. So, and that's what he did. He did that on the cross. Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he wants everybody to be saved. And he's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. You believe. You believe on Jesus Christ. You put in your trust in him to be your crucified brethren and risen Savior. You're in. He wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth. You got people that's ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You got all these smart people, all the smart people you see on TV, all the smart people you see in these talk talk show thingies. They're really smart, way smarter than me when it comes to IQ, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're learning stuff all the time. They can make great things, they can make great inventions. Never able to come to a knowledge of the truth because they won't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you've come to the knowledge of the truth. But they're not doing that. But I'll go ahead and stop there. And next time we'll continue with verse 5.